Praise the Lord. My scripture for this afternoon is going to come from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he had came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in, the, in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses the law commands us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they, so when they continued asking, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And which they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And when Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus said, had lifted up himself, he saw no one but the woman, and he said unto her, Woman, where are thou that accuse you? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. My topic is, Put down your rocks, because it's written in the sand. All right. Her mind refused to believe what was happening. It had, been, it had to be a nightmare. It couldn't be reality. She squeezed her eyes shut, knowing that when she Open them, everything will be all right, and she will wake from this horrible dream. On the count of three, she opened her eyes and blinked against the highest Palestine sun. The truth sunk in. She was still here, and they were still gathered around her. Their eyes shone scorn that, the, that they felt for her. Her humiliation weighed heavy on her shoulders as she sank into herself. Why had they brought her here? They already knew her story. They already passed judgment on her. Why make it worse with public ridicule? Just get over it. Just get it over with. Don't drag on her suffering any longer. Then she saw something she hadn't seen in a long time. Compassion. It was in the eyes of the stranger they brought her to for judgment. Maybe you know the story. Maybe you don't. I, I read it from John 8, 1 through 11. It's pretty self-explanatory, really. All you have to do is read it to get a sense of what is going on. A woman has been caught in the act of adultery, a sin that was considered a crime under Jewish law. As a matter of fact, Rabbi said, "Every Jew must die before he will be commit. Every Jew must die before he will commit adultery, idolatry, murder, murder, or adultery." A view that was obviously shared by the mob, but not the woman, at least not in practice. If you ever heard the story or you heard the phrase, "cast the first stone," which is the central part of what happened that day. This afternoon, we are going to look at the characters who made up the story. The first is the accused. Let's start by clearing up a couple of things right away. All right. First, you ever first, do you ever get the impression that the woman was an innocent bystander? Do you get the idea that she was standing alone and was grasped Jesus by the crowd? But I do often find myself feeling sorry for the woman. What you, why do you say that? She was an adulterer. The Bible says she was caught in bed with a man who wasn't her husband. Now, the Bible does not say what they were doing, but I'm willing to bet they were not playing checkers. Right. Now, in 2013, adultery may not seem all that bad. We probably know at least one adulterer or adulteress, but in Jesus' day, it was a pretty bad accusation. My Lord, my God. The second impression we get is that she was caught at the moment, dragged from the bed, and thrown at the feet of Jesus. The scripture does not say she was caught. The scripture does say she was caught in the very act, so I guess it's safe to assume she wasn't dragged there naked, but whoever caught her, they reported it, and now it was being dealt with. The third impression we get is that the man got away with it. We always hear people saying, where is the man? She could not have been alone as if this were some grand conspiracy where the only the woman was involved would be punished. And we start to think that maybe the man was of some importance. Maybe, but according to uh, uh, one source, the Mishnah or Jewish Kabbalah law states that penalty for adultery for a man will be strangulation and it even lays down the method. A soft towel set within a rough towel is to be placed around his neck so that it won't leave a mark. Then one man pulls in one direction and another man in the other direction until death is reached. Then it says death by stoning is the woman's punishment. So maybe the guy had already paid his price. We know nothing else but this woman's story other than the fact that she was caught in the act of adultery and was being sentenced. There was no defense for her, no appealing to a higher court. She was 
she was the author of her own story with the mob playing to finish it for her as, as a Jewish woman in a Jewish culture, raised with the knowledge of Jewish law, she would have known the consequences of her actions. She, could feel, she couldn't feel sorry for herself. You might feel that the punishment might not fit the crime. After all, what would happen today if all our daughters and daughters were put to death? Mm. Other than the fact that it would solve the overpopulation problem, unemployment issues, and those <laughs> with all those jobs opened up, all, most of us would lose some good friends. Oh my God. This brings us to her accusers, the second of our characters. The scripture tells us that they were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law of Moses. These men were the court of Israel. They were the legal experts of the day. When you had an issue and needed it resolved, this is where you took it. And it was to these men that women were brought, that the woman was brought, probably by her husband, who explained the issues and presented to witness. You see, it wouldn't have been enough that they found her there. They needed to be witnesses. One witness is not enough to prove someone wrong. That That is restated in Deuteronomy 19, 15 or 19. Before you are convicted of a crime, at least two witnesses are called and must testify of your crime before you can be convicted. And if you were caught lying, you would receive the punishment that what they would have gotten. But in reality, the woman's crime did not matter. She was mostly used as a bait for Jesus. You see, Jesus was getting on, the ner on their nerves and they were looking for some way to discredit him. It wasn't the first time and would not be the last. They were, they were the same people from Luke 20 and 22 who asked Jesus, why should we pay taxes to the Europe to the why should we pay taxes? Why should we pay why should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus said, if you can use today's language, why 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 are you violating? Look, look, the money is Caesar's. The money has Caesar's face on it, so give Caesar what is Caesar's and give God what is his. And so the question they pose Jesus is, will you side with the Jew, with, with the with the Jewish law, or your forefather, or were you side with the Roman oppressors? It was really a lose-lose situation for Jesus. He said, stone her. If he said stone her, then they could go to the Romans and say, look, this man is challenging your authority, or they, or if he said let her go, they could go to the Jews and say, he's breaking your law. The woman was a nobody to the Pharisees and the rulers of the law. She had no name, personality, or feeling. She was simply a pawn and a piece to be played with. In the game, they waged against Jesus. They used her like you would a tool, and she just and and she just stood there. So in this story, we see Jesus at the be at his best because, unlike the rulers, he knew the woman because he was there when she was created. He knew her as she formed in her mother's womb. He knew the numbers Go of her hair, the condition of her heart. Unlike the Pharisees, he loved the woman. It was for her he left heaven and allowed himself to die on the cross. All the people were there demanding a response. He didn't say a word. He just bent over and began drawing in the sand. Why did he do that? While I was studying, I found a couple of possible reasons. One was to give himself time. He didn't want to be rushed into a decision. The second was so he wouldn't have to look at them in their eyes. But most important was he was writing down the sins of the people that stood before him. This goes, <laughs> this goes deep into speculation. You see, the Bible was not written in English, but Greek. English is a lazy language. We take one word and make it mean many different things. For example, fast, it can mean to be quick, go without food. It can mean that your colors won't fade, to be such a promiscuous, or that your clock has gained time. The Greek language is more expressive. The word that would have normally been used here would have been graphic, which simply means to write. But when Jesus adds the prefix kata, which means against, making the word katagraphic, which means writing against. Some have suggested that Jesus was writing the man's sin. But however, they still wanted Jesus to make a decision. Jesus said, if any of you be without sin, go ahead and throw stones at her. Wow. Another few began to, one by one, few began leaving, starting with the oldest. Finally, Jesus said to her, is there anyone left here to accuse you? She looked around and said no. They told her, well, then he told her, I will neither go and sin no more. Yes. It's easy to get the wrong idea from this message and think that Jesus took the woman's sins lightly as if it didn't matter. What he said was, I'm not going to judge you now, but you just go and not sin anymore. All he right. gave her a second chance. So if you feel you made a mess in your life, remember, you can get a second chance. Yes. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. Yes. The past is forgotten, all is new. 
Maybe you are standing where that woman stood, knowing that you've done wrong, and you can't imagine what Jesus would want with you. And he's saying, the story's not over. Go and sin no more. It does yeah. not only mean being sorry for your sin, but being sorry and that you turn from your sin. That is called repentance. Listen to the message he has for us today. Go and sin no more.